You're listening to What It's Like with Luz, a podcast highlighting ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Lucy Norris, and on today's episode, I'm sitting down with co-owner and CEO of Unibra, a Belgian family-owned company operating in the real estate and drinks industries. Having grown up in the Congo, this week's guest has always had ties with Africa, but he hadn't imagined after moving back to Europe following the death of his father at age 12, he'd ever end up working back there. Dipping his toes in entrepreneurship after graduating from university, it was his mother's suggestion he enter the family business and re-establish the company on the African drinks market, having previously owned a number of breweries. Taking up the offer, he set to work and years later finds himself CEO of a successful retailer in the space alongside managing the real estate end of things as well. Sharing his secrets to entering foreign markets, balancing two different industries and overcoming challenges, here is what it's like to be Thibaut Relicom. Welcome Thibaut, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. How I want to start this conversation, because I know there's a lot to talk about, is to go all the way back to your childhood, if that's okay, and just chat a bit about what it was like growing up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Excellent, thank you, thank you for asking. I'm happy to be with you, first of all. Um, so back in the days, uh, in 82 in Congo, there was a uh, a president called Mobutu, and he was uh, a strong president. He was uh, extremely, uh, um, I would say, respected, but not always in the positive way. But that was a long time ago, anyway. But the fact to grow in Congo uh, inspired me to uh, always come back to my roots and uh, my Congolese roots, and um, and obviously living there, looking at all the the opportunities, the, uh, the talent of the, uh, the Congolese or the Africans made me dream of uh, coming back at one point in, uh, in Africa. And so when you were growing up, because obviously, you know, you've done so many entrepreneurial things now, you're so heavily involved in business and all that kind of thing. Was that always your initial interest? Did you always know that that was where you'd end up? No, 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 actually, it's uh, quite the opposite because we left in 93 uh, Congo in the middle, middle of a revolution. Um, and I was um, skeptical about, uh, you know, the, the, the veneer, the, the, the future of Congo. Plus, my father passed away, unfortunately, in 94. Um, and therefore, I had a bad taste of Africa, I would say, as a teenager. Um, after my studies that I've done in, in mainly in England, I moved to Switzerland where I was working in real estate. And then in 2008, when the, uh, the great crisis uh, happened, my mother offered me to join the family business huh? because um, Unibra is a, has a legacy. We are I'm the seventh generation and seventh uh, entrepreneur in that company now. And so that was in 2008. And she told me, please join the company, but please consider working in Africa. Um, and what I would say is, um, as mentioned, my family has been into the beer activity since a very long time, uh, since 1829, more or less. However, the, um, when my father passed away in 94, my mother decided to sell all our, our um, uh, breweries uh, that we used to own in Congo. We had four of them at that point. So when I joined the family business in 2008, it was more of a, what we call in, what we call a holding, a financial holding. Uh, Inibra was more of a financial holding. Um, and, uh, but she, she pushed me to, to look at the fact to invest again in Africa in the beer activity. So she was the one who uh, triggered my sense of, uh, of, the, of that African expertise. Yeah. And, then, and then if I can continue, and then in 2008, uh, I decided to make a few trips in Africa, and uh, I would say that I, I fall in love again instantly. Um, everything seems to be so exciting over there. I love the energy. I love. Uh, I, I, I loved it. Um, I, I thought, you know, I remember those great figures about the demography, the growing demography. You know, like in 2050, there would be two billions uh, Africans on the continent. Uh, therefore, we need to uh, create jobs for them, and um, and obviously, has you know most of them. You know, in Africa, there are I think fifty percent of entrepreneurs, because they don't have a job, so they need to create their own job, 
And all that good energy made me feel uh, convinced of getting back to our family roots, which was investing in beer in Africa. And did you ever have any concerns or worries aside from, I suppose, your and maybe negative connotations with it because of your childhood in terms of operating in Africa and doing business in Africa before you went out and saw it and you realized how much growth potential and how much entrepreneurial spirit was there. What were your concerns and fears or did you have any before doing that? So the main fear uh, that I had was uh, controlling businesses from far away. Obviously, I never moved to Africa. Therefore, I had to be surrounded by the greatest people. I had many opportunities to hire talented people who were uh, very engaged. Who were, uh, so, because in Africa, what's difficult is when, you, when you're on the business, uh, managing the, the business, there, there are so many, um, what we call firefighting actions that you must do uh, on a single day. Um, and so you did, therefore managers who are uh, working there needs to be uh, pro problem solvers um, all day long. Um, so that was one thing to, to know how to recruit, uh, hire great talents. Um, another uh, negative aspect uh, that I had in the back of my mind was that everything could change in some countries uh, quite uh, fast, uh, quite quickly. Um, and, and then I would say like in general, but that's more like a common sense for business in general, but you know, you're never managing the time. Therefore, uh, time is always something which is uncertain. You, in Africa, you might have a coup d'etat uh, or in Europe or in the world as now the COVID, which is a black swan. Uh, when you are when you are an investor, you you don't manage that thing. So you cannot you cannot manage everything. But I mean, that's something that I had in the back of my mind. And um, and for the rest, you know, I think to my point of view, um, as an entrepreneur, because that that's what now we people call me. Uh, I never really realized the risk, all the risk. I think I think there are opportunities, and if you work hard, and if you bring on board the right people, if you have the right amount of resource uh, with you, uh, everything my, uh, will, will turn possibly, you know, in a, in a good way, you know, so nothing is impossible, you know, so. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I suppose going back just a step to when you did first enter the family business, as you explained, your mom kind of came to you and, and asked if it would be something you would be interested in. I know I was surprised when we first spoke by how young you are to have you know, be CEO of such a massive company and be doing so many different things. So when you first entered the business, did you have kind of experience before? Did you feel ready to take on such a role or, or what was your kind of transition in terms of um, your, your positioning in the company? Okay, so my personal life made that I lost my father when I was 12, which is young. And therefore, when you miss something, uh, you need to fill it by something else, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this being, being said, uh, obviously I had many people around me who were uh, motivating me, uh, you know, coaching me, mentoring me. Um, then um, you, you see, so the, the feeling of, make, of doing something, all of, you know, of creating opportunities, and of uh, fighting hard and, and having dreams uh, was part of my, uh, of my nature. But then in terms of a work experience, um, after, again, after universities, I, I created with a friend of mine, a company uh, which became a, a company, uh, what we call a, a mobile wallet company. So we were organizing transfer, money transfer from your uh, from your, your your phones, uh, we created that in South America. It was uh, a great success at the beginning, and then it, it, it went sour. <laughs> um, we just sold the company actually uh, a few months ago, so after 15 years, not the best business, but it was uh, okay. And then I went working in uh, in that uh, real estate and hospitality industry in Switzerland uh, for three years. I had the great opportunity to. Uh, to be nominated uh, general manager of a hotel, a five-star hotel when I was, uh, I think like 26 years old, somewhere like this. Um, the, 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 the owner, which was a, an architect, uh, 
we had had great uh, great motivations uh, and again he inspired me quite a bit and I had a good partner at that time uh, who was 10 years older than me uh, full of passion uh, full of uh, of um, dreams again his mission was quite clear um, so in the hospitality business what was amazing was to meet a lot of people on a daily basis that was a lot of fun and managing their uh, expectations on a daily basis so that was very micro and then on the long term especially because that hotel was um, on, on a ski resort so we had a, a huge peak uh, during the winter it was uh, completely shut down during uh, uh, autumn and, and, and springtime and then it was open as well uh, during the summer so there was a lot of uh, volatility uh, in the um, in the seasonality sorry in the business model um, and then what else in terms of work experiences, I was very fortunate to uh, join uh, an, an, an association of, of businessmen called YPO, Young Professional Organization, It was a great resource to me. And then I, I, I wrote as well a few very interesting books, not too many because I, I think we have so much opportunities to read so many books, but I, I just master a few of them. Um, yeah, so that's part of my uh, background, I would say. Yeah, it's quite the extensive experience, you know, in such a small number of years. And so what was it like for you entering into the business and all of a sudden having this responsibility at, I'd say, a higher level to what you were used to before in terms of actually having, you know, a lot of people below you? And then in terms of, as you were saying, like the hiring process, moving into a foreign market, all of those things. How did you handle that? Yeah, so interesting. Again, when I joined the family business, there were no more breweries. So we had a very limited staff, uh, amount of staff. And all of them were, were the same age of my father. So I joined the business in 2008, 2009, more or less. My father passed away 15 years before that in 94. And he was 60 years old. So all the guys that I found of, on the business were quite old. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, myself, my expertise was, it was not a good feeling, first of all, because they were uh, trying to, uh, to um, not to make me, me feel like their son, but I mean, there was, you know, like the, the hierarchy and the generations mixed uh, was not in my favor. Uh, therefore, uh, those gentlemen were very uh, well, good guys, but they didn't really let me do what I wanted to do. And obviously I was young and when you have a young man wanting to do something, you better control him maybe. Uh, but my decision was to replace them, to, uh, to, to renew everything. So actually we moved from one office space to another office space. Like that, I could make a, a, a visible change. I start to hire young people from my generations. I asked those uh, guys to, uh, to, to, to leave me. Um, and we started to, uh, to rebuild everything from scratch with a, with a, a team of, of young folk. It must have been such a, um, not a monumental task, but something that must have been a little bit daunting as well. You know, as you were saying, I could, I could imagine there would be that dynamic between making people take you seriously as a young professional, but then also establishing a good working environment as well with people that were older than you or maybe, you know, had some feelings about someone younger than them being their boss. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So not, again, I think, you know, my expertise makes it quite easier to uh, work with people with the same energy, the same age, the same... When I was 30 years old, when you have your children crying at night and the next day you still have to be very competitive and, uh, and you have someone who's not on the same level as you because these children are older, you know, makes a, a bit of a stretch. So maybe you don't have to bring your issues from home at the office, that's what people say. But we're into a family business as well. So we like to to leave, uh, I would say, those kind of experience, not together, but I mean, to be supportive to that. Um, and then something else, you know, like in terms of uh, energy, uh, we, uh, uh, we, I like even today, actually at six, I'm going to run with one of my colleagues uh, and maybe some others will join. So it's that, those are kind of things that you might do with you know, people from your age. And that's a backbone, which is super important because then you create a lot of trust, a lot of, uh, you share the ambition 
and when uh, there is an issue like the COVID, like whatever comes into uh, a company, but you have something which is different than just the workload. You have you understand the passion, you understand the family of the others, you related to them, they related to you, uh, which makes it uh, easier. You know, it's like when you when you go to go across the desert, you better be sure that you have a tank of fuel which is full. And the tank of fuel in the business is the the trust that you have with your with your guys. If you can, if you didn't build that that trust before, uh, when you're in the in the desert, it's very difficult. So um, yeah, yeah. And so then I suppose when you, as you're mentioning, one of your projects was to reestablish the breweries in Africa, and I suppose your brand out there um, and enter that market again. So. Can you talk me through what that experience was like in the beginning, going back there, starting up again, and also maybe your secret to capturing a foreign market when you are, you know, outsiders coming into to their territory kind of situation? The, 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 you know, like in general, my secret is to work a lot more, you know, like again, if you work, uh, you know, like six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 14 hours, so to work a lot, <laughs> to be surrounded by the right people and to have a good networking um, plus having a straight direction, a straight dream. What do you want to do? You know, like I, myself, I, it's very clear that I want to be a brewer in Africa. I don't want to be a brewer in Asia. I want to be a brewer in Africa. I don't want to go into uh, dodgy countries. I want to go into countries where uh, let's, you know, like one of the issues in Africa is definitely the, the corruption. I don't want to play with that, so I want to go uh, through uh, countries which are uh, straight. Um, though, so, um, but then to come to the second part of your question about uh, uh, you know coming as a challenger in in Africa in in a new uh, uh, in a new country, what was my feel about it? Um, when I was at university, I made my last paper on um, monopolies and uh, and monopoles makes it um, an, a great opportunity for someone to break the monopoly because for sure there are 10 to 15 percent of the people who are obliged to have a product which is the monopoly and and they might and they want to have another exper expertise experience sorry uh, so breaking monopoles that's something that i loved since uh, since uh, since my college time and therefore, when we uh, enter Madagascar and then Rwanda, those two uh, markets were monopolistic markets, and uh, and yes, they were, you know, like the two, uh, well, the, the two, the, the 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 competition was big breweries over there. In Rwanda, it's uh, the company Heineken, and in, in Madagascar, it was a, a family business but established there since 60 years, so very very influent. Um, but I think we don't have to fear anybody. You just need to make it right for, for you. Uh, okay, you have to respect some of the rules. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the, the pricing that they put on the, um, on the market, because you see if they have 100% of the market, uh, well, the price that they give is the price which is fixed by, the, by, by them, by the, by the, by the leader. Um, but then for the rest, you know, like I wouldn't, try to compare myself too much to them. I think you need to be creative, innovative. You need to bring some different experience to uh, your, to the consumers. Um, so it, it depends on case by case, but uh, we, we like as well as a family me member. And, and I think it's very important not to be arrogant with our stakeholders. So uh, I, I do personally, but all my staff have very good uh, relationship with our uh, uh, distributors. Uh, with the, the, the local politics, uh, not the, the head of the politics, but the proximity politics, if you understand me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, you need to be uh, accessible, you, you know, not arrogant. You need to bring a, you know, a product of quality. We always go for, for the best quality. It's easy to say that, but it's, uh, if, if it is part of your values and if you, you and, and your team are constantly chasing that, um, and, and you need to find as well those uh, things of differentiation. So that innovation, for, for instance, in Rwanda, it was, uh, uh, we, we, we brew a, a beer without sugar. In Ethiopia, it was, uh, we had a pull off cap in instead of a normal caps, caps, you know, on top of the, of the, of the bottles of beer. 
in Madagascar, uh, the market was 33 centiliter and we moved to 500 uh, centiliter. So you need to find your way. Of course, with Unibra, there is the beer side of things, but then there's also the real estate side too. So how do you split your brain between managing all of the, the beer stuff and then you know switching quickly to worry about your real estate holdings as well? Yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, again, family business is a human adventure. So um, and, and, and we know that the resource are financials. Uh, that's an important resource. And again, I was blessed to receive some uh, money from my family when I started the business. That was, uh, yes, uh, incredible. <laughs> Even if then I risk everything and in Africa and, and uh, fortunately we were lucky, but I mean, uh, the resource, which are humans, financials, and the time. Uh, the time you can stretch it a bit. Uh, you sleep a bit less. The financials, you need to uh, to reassure, to have it from family-wise and to reassure your bankers. And then uh, the humans in general, you, you need to convince talented people to, uh, to join you. You need to uh, make them dream of your dream. You need to uh, uh, understand their, um, their expectations. Uh, which are different from one person to another, but you, you need to, to create that link uh, and to make them part of, of the human adventure and the family you know, legacy uh, of, the, of the business. Um, and, and, you know, like being surrounded by the right people makes sure that you can, yeah, maybe have a few different uh, investments in a few different industries. So uh, for me, real estate was, as I mentioned, because before 2008, I was working at hotel and, and it was not only hotel, it was a, a real estate project with, the, uh, with a, a nice five-star hotel in the middle of it. So I was you know, very excited by, uh, by the real estate. Um, so that was my first, I would say, love in terms of uh, what I wanted to bring to, uh, to, the, to Unibra, to the family business. And then, as I mentioned, my mother pushed me a bit to Africa. But I, I looked at the real estate at the beginning as the, um, uh, how am I going to say that in English, but as something which is very stable into the business because I, I was investing into uh, buildings, added value buildings, where we could uh, uh, increase the lease or increase the, or de decrease the vacancy of the, the tenants or, uh, you know, but, but it was quite uh, um, foreseen. Uh, it was stable. We had stable revenues on there. And, and at that time, we were just doing asset uh, in, uh, well, prop, uh, investments, property investments. So we we're just managing our own assets. Um, but that, that made me feel very secure about the fact that I could generate and provide sufficient uh, money for my family. And, and the rest, I, I, I could, with the agreement of my mother and my sister at that time, uh, invest in Africa and take a bit more risk and go for a, a nice adventure, a nice, uh, yeah, a nice human adventure. Um, so, but in, in the real estate, after uh, I think five years, well, several years, I would say, then I, I fall in love with uh, looking at more the opportunities on the long term in the real estate. And instead of just buying, renting, renovating, I thought that buying old buildings that I could transform upgrade but massively uh, was interesting and then I, therefore I moved to more of a promotion of the promotion side of the real estate so looking for you know like uh, old office buildings and moving them to uh, residential and again I, I hired the right person at that at that moment which and that person was inspiring me um, and and then we, we we started to be known on the market as you know doing that and then we had some opportunities to buy land, so like a green field, like a, a land without a, a, a permit. And therefore we had the opportunity to go and grab the permits. So we had to be surrounded by the best architect and, and blah, 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 you know, and you, you just get on board of, we, I, I wouldn't have said 10 years ago that we would have become a, a real estate promoter as of now, uh, aside of the breweries as well. Uh, it was not perceived even by me, but I think, you know, like when go, things goes properly, when 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 you you discover something which is uh, attracting you, when you're coming out of your, you know, it's a nice word, but like out of your zone of comfort, 
and you uh, and you keep on growing with a you know quality people around you and that you have the passion to uh, to wake up every day and to yeah to fight for against the adversity of of any uh, business um yeah so today um when i woke up in the morning i'm happy to uh, to to do both um uh, i'm happy to have the right people uh, around me and again because you know that's so important on my own i, I wouldn't have done much you know uh, it's always a, an addition of people of the right energy uh, with the right uh, dream mission and uh, yeah, and then a, a bit of luck as well the timing that i mentioned is important you know like uh, companies can go uh, you know bankrupt uh, not because they are not managed properly well maybe they, they they were a bit too aggressive but because of the covid you know like the all those companies in events or or restaurants uh, you know th those guys couldn't uh, so that's what we call a, a black swan but that's just bad luck you know uh, <laughs> just moving into like the last two questions i have for you and then i'm going to to let you go but this is more i suppose kind of just a tiny bit of personal reflection on what, what you've been through so far. Do you have a definition of success or something, maybe a, a marker in life or anything that you would come across that you would then sit and deem yourself to be successful? Yeah, so, well, so many aspects. So uh, I, I would be vague to, to define success. Uh, my own success is to be recognized by uh, my family and, and my uh, and my teammates as uh, as someone who's providing uh, good around me, uh, and good what means good is uh, creating jobs, is uh, taking the risk and building things that someone else would not have uh, thought about. Uh, um, you know, like money wise, definitely money is important, but it's, it, it doesn't, it, it cannot. Well, it's not for me at, at least. The main driver. Uh, you know, money is a commodity, you know, it goes from one side to the other. And uh, again, it's very important to start things. But even like for, for those who, who don't have the, the, the initial capital to do an, a great uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, adventure, especially today in the 21st century, you can find money uh, with a good idea. You can find money everywhere. Uh, so, uh, um, but yeah, success would be... Uh, uh, to to have the time to to secure time for myself and my family and and still and to have a a, a quality business where you create jobs where you have a good uh, diversity uh, of, uh, yeah, of, of of activities having fun and and having a good life and uh, yeah that's that's important as well. Yeah, no, I think that's a great definition. And I suppose leading on from that, if you had the chance to go back to your 10 year old self, having been on the journey that you've been on, you know, gone through everything that has happened since that age, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give that 10 year old self who was moving forward in life? So definitely to, de to, um, to brainstorm and to define your, your vision. Uh, you know, what, what drives you clearly? And I like that question. Uh, if you would die, it's a very dramatic question, but if you would die in, in one year or in 10 years or, or even at the end of the life uh, of your life, when you're very old, what do you want people to remember of you? You know, and if you, and okay, it's not good to look from the eyes of the others, but what would your children uh, would think of you? And, and if you can define that, in a way, uh, okay, I want my children for myself that, that say that I was good, a good man for Africa and for the nature. Uh, I have a strong, uh, sustainable sense uh, on, on doing business in terms of ecology. Um, so define your, your mission and then to be focused, to try, which is not always my case actually, but to try to be as much focused as you can. And as I mentioned earlier, I used to read a lot of business books and uh, since uh, a few years, I'm, I'm, I'm reading just one book called Becoming Your Best by uh, Steve Schellenberger. And I, I read it five times over the last uh, three years. Um, instead of reading all the books, uh, I just try to master uh, that, that one because I strongly believe in it. So, yeah, if you want to be good, you know, Jack, I mentioned that as well. You know, the first 10 years of your career, you can do mistakes and then you start to 
to uh, to be very focused. I mean, if you want to make a fortune on this, uh, that's the definition. When you're 45, you need to be an expert in one one in one division, and you need to uh, yeah. So I would say that if someone likes beer, you better read uh, articles about beer instead of uh, articles about uh, uh, you know like uh, new technology, whatever you know, because you need to master, master, master. Well, that's really great pieces of advice. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for giving up your time because I know you're so busy. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. It's, it's very interesting to, uh, to speak with you uh, uh, and to share and as well all your questions were, you know, uh, very good to, uh, to reflect on. So it was a, a good journey to, uh, to have you for a few minutes. Thank you so much for listening and as always, please rate, share and leave a comment if you like what you hear. And don't forget to follow at what it's like pod on Instagram and Facebook. To find out more about Tebow and Unibrow, visit the links provided in the show notes. I'll be back on Monday with more inspiring stories, but for now this has been What It's Like with Loose.